we basically understood stellar evolution. There's lots of interesting remaining problems, but we were able to do numerical simulations. Computers were sophisticated enough that they can do one-dimensional stars, spherically symmetric stars. Right, that was a, a hard thing to do in 1955. And with that, we realized that the key things that drove stellar evolution were first mass. Once you told me a star's mass that to and its age, that told me most of what I needed to know. And we then realized there were other parameters, angular momentum, metallicity, some detailed things about what led to their, its magnetic field level that determined its properties. And armed with that, we could then match the observation, our theoretical, uh, we had a theoretical framework, we could run computer simulations, compare them to the key observations there were the HR diagram and how stars populated the HR diagram, right? Because you were able to compare how much the, the density of stars in different regions to your theoretical calculations. I think that the great challenge for, you know, uh, the next 10 to 20 years uh, on the theoretical side is to make the same progress with galaxies. I think we're now armed with the same in that mode. Okay. Let's see. Uh, we're now armed with the same, I'd say, key bit of initial. Uh, we understand the key input physics now. You want me to s run Java, okay. There's no Java in here. Um, we understand the initial conditions from our observations of microwave background and large scale structure. I would say well enough that while we don't know whether dark matter properties, say, play an important role on the dwarf galaxy scale, when we get to the scales of galaxies that we're talking about in these surveys, uh, L star galaxies, I think one can make a very good case that the cold, the lambda CDM model tells us all we need to know. We know the equivalent, I would say now, of nuclear fusion for our colleagues studying stellar studied stellar evolution. We know the framework of dark matter that's there. And the challenge is, given, um, you know, our understanding of initial conditions, can we understand the properties of galaxies? And I think there's a bunch of pieces in there. The first, which I think we have made pretty good progress on, is understand the evolution of dark matter clustering. I think both on the level of numerical simulations where the simulations basically agree on given initial conditions, what do you get? We have good analytical theory that given the initial conditions, what do you get? I think we now recognize the importance of that there's a difference between the clustering of dark matter and the clustering of halos. And that we're making progress in understanding the evolution of halo clustering, um, <coughs> certainly at the computational level, but I think also at the level of um, analytical theory. What I think is r hard right now is understanding how we go from halos to galaxy properties. And I think we have to really think about this not just as galaxy luminosity, but we actually have to do is, you know, when Nikhil starts telling us about surveys in the next talk, each one of these surveys selects galaxies in a particular way. And when you measure the clustering properties, we're not measuring clustering properties of dark matter. We are measuring clustering properties of galaxies that have undergone a particular selection in color, in uh, line strength. There's a certain set of properties. And I've used this L nu really as a, a surrogate for a whole list of what we select for or, wh or what the observers select for. And how does that depend on all these parameters? And I think one of the things we've learned, so you know, we're not at the beginning of the, sto of the stellar revolution story. We're, you know, probably halfway there, I'd say. I think we know 
that halo mass is a really important premise, that it's tied directly to luminosity of the galaxy, and it's tied to the clustering properties. I don't know what of this list of things, including things in the dot, 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 what's the next most important parameter for determining the clustering properties and the observational properties of the galaxy beyond its halo mass? We know, we know this dependence on environment. We know there are a bunch of pieces. But if I gave you the initial conditions and told you you're looking at this halo, this is its environment, this is its history. Inf uh, <coughs> how that is going to determine whether that halo will produce a galaxy that will end up in DAISY or end up in PFS or W first or Euclid or whatever. We do not, we, you know, we know halo mass is a good start, but what, what is that? And if we're going to need to understand that. Well, it depends on what. Well, I think we want to understand it for two reasons. One is we'd like to understand why galaxies are the way they are, right? I mean, this is one of the things we want to do as astrophysicists is just is understand the origin of galaxies. Second, um, marginalization is a very dangerous world to live in. We're all used to doing this, but you'll find if you marginalize over a high dimensional parameter space that your representation of the parameter space biases your answer. This was a lesson I learned when we first started trying to marginalize, you know, if you have the CMB observation, you have a very large, or start, you used to have, a large degeneracy space where uh, there was a, as you change the Hubble constant, you would go from a flat universe to one with, um, you know, a lambda that, and a no lambda and very positively curved. That space was, you know, 2003 was just with that data alone was allowed. If you change parameterization from uh, assuming that your prior is flat in H naught to flat in omega matter to flat in 1 over H naught, you get different answers. Things get much worse when you have a space that's, you know, 10 dimensional and you have no physical understanding of where that param what those parameters are. And we, you know, the right answer isn't that the universe draws randomly from what the second order bias terms are. There is a physical answer to the question what the second order bias terms are that is determinable. And if you just marginalize over it, that's not, um, you will not necessarily get the, the right answer. You will be biased in a way in which you don't understand. So I think one has to, you know, this. Uh, Bayesianism is a religion that has, uh, you know, uh, developed a lot. You know, I, I, I share some guilt in helping to propagate that religion, um, but I think you have to recognize that the assumption, there's this assumption that there, um, in m that we, nature draws randomly from a set of points, a set of values that to me seems a really weird way of thinking about physics. Um, you know, people think about this when inflationary models, when they assume that, uh, to go off tangent a bit, that, you know, nature randomly chooses a function for the input time potential and we draw from a set of randomly chosen functions. I'm not sure that's the way the laws of physics were set initially. I think, you know, I think that actually might be an underlying theory. And 
at the level of galaxy evolution, I think we, you know, um, you could either assume bias as a function of mass, it takes something where I think we have some understanding, is a free function that you marginalize over. And that will give you one set of answers. Or you could actually go to a combination of numerical simulations and analytical theory and determine bias as a function of mass and use that as the input into calculation. The right, the right physics. That's right. And, you know, my prejudice would be you'd like to marginalize over it, see if it gives you the, you know, same answer. Oh, no, oh, oh. That's right. That's right. Yeah. No, that's. And just want to remind people that you know, uh, when people uh, at a you know not the, we're not talking about one percent effects here. We're talking about how. Bias depends on galaxy properties and parameters. So this is from a, a study of the Sloan clustering. This is one slide of, you know, one figure of many from a paper from Zahavi et al., um, where you're looking at clustering properties of red galaxies and blue galaxies. And I want you to note that, um, and this is halo model fits, which are good but not perfect. Um, not only are the amplitudes different, but the slope as a function of scale is different. And that there is an environmental dependence of clustering that's pretty important out to the 10 megaparsec scale. That's a pretty big scale. And if you like to work in k-space, you know, physics that happens at the 10 megaparsec scale gets pushed out in k-space to really low k. So, you know, we, we do need to understand what makes a galaxy red, what makes a galaxy blue, and how that's going to end up in the selection function in the, the large-scale structure. S and, uh, One, I mean, the halo model is, you know, um, basic, you know, assumes that halo mass determines everything in its usual form, right? And that's a good first step, right? Because I, th I think that we know that's the most important parameter. But I think we know other parameters like environment also matter. And we need to become more sophisticated, I would argue, as we think about how do we want to modify the tools we use to, uh, um, to, uh, to, to basically, th the data is getting so much better. We need to be more sophisticated in how we talk about the relationship between halos and galaxies. I'm glad you asked that because I, th you know, I was con uh, one, you know, I thought I wasn't convinced of that until Sarud and here and now and my collaborators, they started looking at assembly bias and just show you some, summarize some results from a recent paper. And Sarud will talk more about this later. We took red mapper clusters, you know, these are, Massive clusters, pretty well understood set. We use the projected separation of member galaxies, so how concentrated the member galaxies are. 
to divide the galaxies into two samples, those that had were more concentrated based on the distribution of members, those that were less concentrated. And we went and looked at their properties. And these are from weak lensing measurements. These are the two surface density profiles. And here's the ratio. The two samples had the same total mass within a megaparsec. So these have these are the same halo masses. Different internal structure. When you look at their clustering properties, their clustering properties differed by nearly a factor of two. So this is halo mass is the same. That's the you know that's the same observed parameter. Properties and clustering are, no are enormously different. And you can see here's the fits to the parameters. In you're looking at very different biases for those populations. And you can imagine doing a measurement of large scale structure where you have your mixture of these populations is varying as a function of redshift. Things can, uh, things like that could matter. And we see the same thing in the clustering. So this is not, not looking at the lensing now, but the autocorrelation function. So this is the, um, the two samples. They differ. Yeah, so that the selection is, for the whole sample, is red mapper clusters. And the parameter we used was we looked at the members, of the cluster members. Uh, red mapper comes with the probability of membership, so we weighted accordingly. And what's the characteristic size of the cluster? Is it concentrated or not? And this is... Well, the, so the, the selection is based on richness, okay? But richness ends up being, it seems, a pretty good indicator of halo mass, independent of this uh, characteristic radius. So the fact that we see the same mass enclosed within a megaparsec means that that lambda selection and R mem don't seem to correlate, you know, when I, R mem doesn't seem to have anything to do with halo mass. Well, there's a difference in the inner. The concentration parameter is a bit different between the two. But but you know the galaxy. But you know, uh, I would you know view this uh, these results as a warning that's telling us that halo mass is not enough. Uh, it doesn't matter for your L star galaxy, but if we're going to do 1% measurements of cosmology, right, which is what, not from rate map to, this is a sample we could study, hey, we can see clear evidence for assembly bias. The fact that we're seeing, this is a factor two effect, right? This is not small. Means that to me, that there could be a 5% effect on the galaxy scale that we have missed up to now. Because we, ha you know, we haven't looked for it. We, have, we don't have the right parameterization. I th
So let, let's discuss. I, I, I wanted to use this purely, um, partly to set up Sarud's talk, so everyone will be paying attention, because I think this is a cool result that deserves attention, but mostly because I want to set up what I think are um, challenges that I think we need to be thinking about. Um, for the questions we're addressing, the thing we need to know from the simulators are what's the link between initial conditions and galaxy properties, right? Are there things, and you know, at the moment there's a cultural thing that people studying dark matter only simulations are really interested in things like assembly bias. People with hydro in their codes are really interested in feedback. And they're really thinking hard. No, and that's an important problem. And not, um, is understanding the role of feedback in determining galaxy properties. But um, we, for using galaxies as large-scale structure probes, we need this link between initial conditions, things like does tidal field matter, do the, or is there more than halo mass as a parameter. I mean, I think we need to have a theoretical understanding of what else might matter because we then want to be able to turn around, look at the observations, and say, when we're studying our large-scale structure observations, what we should be looking for is, you know, at fixed luminosity, say, does Sersic profile, is that the number thing we should look at to see clustering depends on more than the Sersic profile? Probably, if we care about galaxy formation history, we actually have to start looking at actual properties of galaxies, right? So you want a survey that gets more than just a redshift for the galaxy, a survey that has, uh, you know, we'd like, say, a bigger telescope that has a multi-fiber spectrograph than a four meter. And, you know, to complement, you know, it's not just volume that matters for understanding galaxies. If we're going to be systematic limited, we're going to be limited by um, our understanding of the galaxy properties. It's not just getting really sparse samples and large volumes. And uh, though I think it's great that we're doing that, but I think we need to also be thinking at the same time about um, deeper surveys. We need to be understanding the link between halo mass and galaxy properties. And I think that's why, you know, things to be thinking about as we're combining lensing surveys with spectroscopic surveys and so on. And I think one of the challenges for theory and one of the things that I hope people are thinking about <coughs> over the next couple days, longer hopefully, is, you know, I think one of the goals of theory in this area is to develop the framework for interpreting um, observations and simulations. You know, I think we've done, you know, we as a community, and there are a couple people in this room, played a key role in this. Um, we've done pretty well with halo mass, right? We understand the framework for that. We understand the framework for going from halo mass to luminosity observations. I'm not sure what the next thing we should be looking at is, w you know, and what that, how we can turn to the obser observations and simulations and and pull that out. And I think that's, um, to me, going beyond um, the current bias as a function of mass description means thinking about is there more physics, how do we identify that, and what is the most important physics to study. So that's what I wanted to end with. Um, one of the things I'm ho hopeful about is that we could, we'll be able to combine it with lensing observations behind the 
galaxies and get some understanding of our sample. So I think the combination of um, is helpful. Um, I'm hoping that we'll have a broad enough set of different of galaxy subsamples within these sa uh, surveys that we could understand the properties as a, as a function of sample selection. Um, you know, that's interesting, of course, for, for things like understanding non-Gaussian 80 set different populations. But I th think we can, um, we will better believe the conclusions we can draw from the simulations, both about galaxy formation and um, uh, initial conditions, if we can uh, uh, effectively have a broader set of selection. Um, and that's, that's not the way s PFS or I think any sample, everyone's going for uniform samples because they want to have the largest volume possible because they want their sample, their volume to be bigger than others. But I think we may be better off with a broader, with several different populations. Ideally, several populations that are co-located that we can use to, to study things. And that, uh, that I think would be, you know, um, now, that's my intuition. I think one of the things you know, that we need to do, you know, if most of us like, uh, think of ourselves as theorists, is if we think this is right, we need to articulate this case in a way in which uh, ob observers will um, implement it. Let me give you a physical example that I worry about, which is the amount of AGN feedback that happens early probably is important. It, you know, if I have a galaxy that forms, I have two galaxies that end up with the same halo mass. One forms a more massive AGN early that drives powerful winds. The other is, uh, is formed from two smaller halos that uh, have a different AGN history. The amount of baryons that are blown out in the tube, I could, could imagine differing by 10 or 20 percent. We know that of order, the same numbers of baryons are blown out as end up in the galaxy. And having a 10 to 20 percent variation based on different galaxy histories seems to me to be quite plausible. That could lead to a 10 to 20 percent variation in mass to light ratio, which the luminosity function is steep enough that that dependence would translate into differences in clustering properties. There could also be differences in the, based on the assembly history, the characteristic age of stars. And, you know, even let's take, uh, uh, you, know, uh, an ellipse, you know, luminous red gal LRGs, right? They're pretty boring star formation histories. But if I have two populations where one, um, on average, started half a billion years earlier than the other, that's going to translate to a difference in mass to light ratio for the population. And that I w in ways like that, um, assembly history or angular momentum are other parameters which 
we think of as stochastic random things producing scatter um, that is uncorrelated with large scale structure could give rise to things that, you know, as we're moving to the next level of precision, we at least need to know enough to look for them and say they're not important. So, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, I, I uh, yeah, I mean, mass is, is the most important parameter, and at what level the next things come in, I think we need to understand. 